to you by Gilbert Hospital in Florence at Anthem Hospitals. I'm Dr. Ann Borick, board certified in internal medicine, and I'm here to keep you up to date on the latest information pertaining to your health and well-being. Welcome to Doc Talk Radio. Joe, how are you today? I'm good, Dr. Borick. Thank you. Good. We have some guests in the studio uh, here. You know, Doc Talk Radio is sponsored by Gilbert Hospital and Florence Hospital at Anthem. Um, today we're going to be talking about uh, GI, gastroenterology uh, type topics, um, but first we're going to focus a little bit on weight loss and obesity. We have Dr. Sudahar Reddy and Sharon Magdalona, who is a nurse practitioner. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Dr. Thank Reddy, you very much. you've been here before. Yes. And, uh, and so it's really great for you to take your time out to, to come back and, and to spend your time on Doc Talk Radio with and us. Thank you very much for calling us back. Great, great. Sharon, um, I want to uh, welcome you. Thank you. As a nurse practitioner, um, tell us a little bit about, before we get into you know, talking about the topics and getting some calls and so forth, about um, nurse practitioner. I've not really had a nurse practitioner on the show. Um, maybe a little bit about what your educational process is and so forth and what you do as a nurse practitioner. Okay, well first to become a nurse practitioner you technically have to have a bachelor's degree in nursing and then you go into your master's degree and get the nurse practitioner training. And um, I am a family nurse practitioner so I pretty much can do anything from pediatrics to OBGYN but since I met Dr. Reddy I've been doing GI since. Excellent and I remember working with you in the hospital yes um, years ago as as a nurse right? Correct. So Tempe yeah at Tempe St. Luke's that's right that's right um, so it's a small community here and you, and you never know when you're gonna cross paths again so so welcome. Um, you know I want to get to talking about the, the medically supervised weight loss program that uh, that you work with and that you do. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about what that is? You know, really what is a medically based weight loss program? Well, um, we are, our corporate office is actually based in New York City and what it is is it's technically physician supervised weight loss program. It's looking at a person not only as somebody who is fat, somebody who is obese, but also considering the other comorbidities that they have like diabetes, hypertension, thyroid problems, hormone deficiencies or imbalances because all this can affect um, the weight gain or the weight loss. Exactly. Yeah, so we're looking at all that and also the incorporation of the right nutrition, the right diet, getting off the addiction to food, as well as incorporation of medications. And for now, we have four FDA approved medications only that we can prescribe safely for patients needing medications. Okay. So. Um so there are medications that are that are prescribed to help with the whole process of weight loss. Do you do you want to kind of tell us what what those meds are, or is it something? Um, I mean, I don't know if you want to share that information. Or? Yes, okay. absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, so for years and years, I'm pretty sure that a lot of people are very familiar with the fentermin, yes, which is originally the first medication that is FDA approved for uh, weight loss, mm -hmm. and then there is the Seneca which is now we can get it uh, over the counter as a live medication. And then recently we have the Belvic that was just FDA approved, I think I would say Dr. Reddy two months ago. Two months ago, yeah. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then uh, the one that is available now is what we call as Gisemia, which is a combination of Phentermine and Topiramate. Okay. So all these medications, we only have four medications. And I know for a fact that we have a lot of weight loss offices that are using medications which are not FDA approved. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So safety wise, I would say that we are on top of it. Okay, so fentermine, I know, is that one of the medicines that you guys use in, in your prescribing? Yes, it used to be, but mm -hmm. I think it's going to be supplanted by the newer medications that have just been FDA approved okay. and are much more effective. and. Right, because I mean, from a medical perspective, we you know we know that there's some side effects to to fen fen and those kinds of things with pulmonary hypertension and and uh, so some of the newer FDA approved medicines taking the place of that I think is is probably a a good thing. Uh, you're absolutely right, Dr. Borek, and I think that I want to emphasize the fact that this is physician directed. Mm -hmm. When I say physician, I mean Sharon is a nurse practitioner and just equally competent in handling this. Right. We have had extensive training in how to prescribe these medications, mm -hmm. how to uh, properly select the right patient, what kind of a, um, a medical uh, um, testing that the patient needs to undergo mm -hmm. before they get on a, a weight loss program. Well, this is not like, you know, you show up at the door and we give you a prescription right. for this or that. We practice medicine alongside 
with maintaining, making sure that you lose weight. Right, and I think that's the key. That's really the key to success. You know, you know, it's interesting. I was reading a study um, where globally, there the increase in the incidence of obesity is like 30 percent higher than it had been. We know that people are less active you know, in jobs around the world. I think in China, probably one of the, the highest incidence of immobility due to their job, which is lending to higher incidence of obesity that then turns into diabetes and heart disease and all the comorbidities. So I think what you're doing is really, really important to, uh, to help with, you know, the disease processes. That's great. I want to invite any callers out there to call in. Our number is 480-745-1033. Um, you know, Dr. Reddy, we, you know, we've talked about, as a gastroenterologist, you know, I'd like to kind of focus on a couple different things. We're going to talk a little bit about liver disease, hepatitis C in particular. Um, do you want to kind of share with us some of the latest research in, in terms of, um, you know, hepatitis C and what they're recommending now? Oh, thank you so much for bringing that topic up because it's so timely. Just a couple of months ago, CDC made the recommendation that every person in the baby boomer age group should be tested for hepatitis C because uh, the statistics and studies have shown that there is a large number of patients who have not been tested and don't know that they have a treatable condition. And the reason I say it is treatable is uh, compared to in the past when we only had a few different medications, we have even more potent and more effective medications that are available for treatment of hepatitis C. Uh, untreated hepatitis C can lead to cirrhosis, and you know soon it's going to become like one or number one or number two reason for liver transplantation in this country. So we can avoid a lot of complications in the future if you can diagnose them as well as treat them. Right. So I think the message out there, just to reiterate that, um, a, a recommendation: anybody that is a baby boomer, born well, from like 1956 to 1963, I think in that in that time period. And 10 um, years plus or minus, doesn't matter. Right, so, I mean, exactly. Uh, to be tested, and it's a simple blood test, is that right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. And um, hepatitis C is a virus. And so I, you, I know we were talking earlier about some of the, the newest and success of, of treating this virus. Sharon has treated a whole bunch of patients in the last six months with incredible success rates, and I'm sure she'll be glad to talk. Uh, yeah, elaborate sure. On let's that. talk about that. What, uh, medication form, IV form. What is the what is the route? What does it look like in terms of treatment for hepatitis C? Actually, what it is is before we even considering treatment a patient for hepatitis C, we have very important guidelines that we have to follow. One of them is, you know, is the patient still in drugs or is the patient mm -hmm. alcoholic? What are the other comorbidities that the patient have? Because right. there are certain contraindications for treatments. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is we've got to know what genotype of the virus the patient have because different genotype calls for different kind of treatments. Mm -hmm. uh, we have, I think, three treatable genotypes. We have the 1A, 1B, and the 2 um, B uh, genotypes that are currently treatable. And um, depending on the type of genotype, then we pick and choose the kinds of treatment that we have. We are now the most, the very famous treatment is the triple therapy, which is a combination of um, an antiviral medication, the ribavirin, as well as the Pegasus. Mm -hmm. So what I have seen in the patients that we are currently treating is, I would say that as of today, we have 100% success Excellent. in the treatment of patients with hepatitis C, especially those who are on triple therapy. There are currently two new medications that we have included in the treatment, and those are the Incivic and uh, Bacivivir. Mm -hmm. And I have seen the viral load actually non-detectable in two weeks' time. Wow, that's, that's amazing. You know, just for our listeners, give us a little information about uh, how hepatitis C is transmitted. You know, because um, a lot of people say, well, can I get it from a dirty toilet seat? Or, how, you know, how, how do I catch this virus, if you will? Because um, I think the first step in prevention is to know really how it's transmitted. So transmission primarily is still number one is still, you know, the drug use from before, sharing of the needles mm -hmm. is still the number one primary prevention. That's why, you know, given that we are entering the silver tsunami age or the baby boomers getting older, we've always got to make sure and to go back into their history if they have had a history of usage of drugs. or Even, drugs even just one time. Even just one time, especially if they share needles. Another one is sexual transmission. And there are some claims about blood transfusions in the year 1960s, 1970s, mm -hmm. but so far it's bloodborne. 
It's bloodborne. Saliva, tears. Not much, bad. much, much less likely. I mm-hmm. mean, I think the predominant mode of transmission is by uh, blood and blood products. Uh, obviously, if there was any tissue or organ transplantation, there would have been. But again, okay. um, the, the, it's very, very rare. Okay. Okay. And that's good to know. And today, I mean, you know, we have patients that ask, is it safe to get a blood transfusion? And um, it is absolutely safe in my, you know, in the hospital and... and but I'd like to hear from you. What, what is your response to that question? Uh, my uh, feeling is uh, blood transfusion is extremely safe. Uh, there is no 100% foolproof guaranteed uh, way of, uh, based on the knowledge that we have in today's times, I think that's about the safest thing. Okay, okay, very good, very good. Joe, do we have a question or a comment there? We did. It's kind of jumping a little bit forward, though. This was about the weight loss medications. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, Regina from Phoenix uh, says, I am about 100 pounds overweight, 45-year-old female. Uh, Can you explain the process of uh, your different medications? Is there a different food program, uh, prepackaged? Is it tons of exercise, no carbs, or what? And she said, thanks a lot. Very good. That's good, because we wanted to kind of, you know, complete that, that thought process with the weight loss program. So do you want to kind of outline what, you know, what your recipe is? You know, what specifically you recommend um, to get to that success with weight loss and uh, treating uh, obesity? Our program, which is also called uh, the Physician's Weight Loss, uh, is based on first an initial consultation where we really want to meet you in person. Uh, it's very inexpensive and, uh, you know, it's probably going to cost you nothing more than $30. Uh, but w- uh, the, m- the most important thing we want to learn from you is how committed you are to the losing the weight because we want a patient who is committed to losing the weight because that's where we're going to get the most successful results. Mm-hmm. Once you have made that determination that you really truly want to lose the weight, we will help you hold your hand and do everything we possibly can to make so sure that it is successful. And Sharon is excellent with holding hands. I know that for mm-hmm. sure. <laughs> uh, the second component of that is that we do what's called a body composition analysis, which will really tell us what your um, body weight is, what your fluid weight is, what your muscle weight is. And then we also calculate what's called your BMR or your basal metabolic rate, which will help us calculate you know, what kind of a nutritional plan that you need to be on. We have different kinds of plans depending on how much weight you want to lose, how much weight you need to lose, and what other comorbidities you have, such as diabetes, high blood pressure, arthritis. And we will try to work with you in terms of making sure that it is successful, not only in the short term, but what we want to emphasize is that you lose the weight and keep it off, and that you're not kind of going yo-yo where you lose weight and gain it back, which is pretty much what happens with a lot of other programs. Right. Right. And it's important to know if they're diabetic, then that way you can, you know, tailor your, your treatment. Um, that's good. That's great. If there's any other questions, feel free to call in and, and we can, and, you know, revisit there. And I want to give Sharon an opportunity to kind of elaborate a little bit more on the process of, you know, when you come for an initial consultation, what happens. That would be great if you want to kind of walk us through that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So Dr. Reddy has covered the first, the, the initial process and the in- initial st- steps. However, um, after knowing what we need to know, your BCA or your body composition analysis, um, she, I think Regina asked whether or not we use prepackaged food. We actually base, we use uh, protein shakes, which is tailored fits for the program itself. So our programs, we have, I think, I would say six different programs from quick start to modify to accelerated program. And all those just depends mainly on the basal metabolic rate of the person. Um, what is the level? You know, what are the other comorbidities? Like, for instance, if you are diabetic, we definitely could not put you on prepackaged only. We have to incorporate a real diet, real food mm-hmm. in your diet. So it makes it a lot better because you don't only depend on prepackaged food, but you can actually eat and you can actually retrain yourself to make food okay. and prepare food that would work for you in the long uh, term. Right. You know, I always think of food as um, as a as a nutritional supplement. You know, um, you know, not to avoid certain like vegetables and fruits, but to eat them because there's benefit to the body that we now know. So it's just a whole different mindset. What about exercise? Is that part of what you do? Yes, our recommendation is for females. We do recommend um, activity or mainly cardio exercises for 30 minutes for five days. For males, it's mostly 30 minutes for three days. 
and the difference is because males have a higher muscle mass and also their uh, basal metabol metabolic rate is usually higher compared to the females. Interesting. You know, there's studies looking at breast cancer risk cut in half when we exercise, you know, a certain amount of time per week. So there's so many more benefits that we can gain from exercise rather than just losing weight, which is, you know, huge in and of itself. What about stress management? Is that a, a, a part of it or counseling and, you know, because um, I think that's a big part. You know, when people are stressed, which I think, by the way, is an epidemic in our country today, Correct. Um, people tend to eat more yes. and, you know, sleep less. And then that whole cortisol, you know, cycle continues and people gain weight and, what are you what are you doing in we, reference to that we have approximately 25 modules for counseling Excellent. itself so like i said earlier we don't only treat the person because of their weight mm -hmm. but we'll look at also the psychological aspect of the person are they depressed have they just lost somebody that you know that is important to them mm -hmm. how stressed they are because you know, a lot of these hormones and enzymes that is being produced by the body can cause the person to eat more, right. sleep less, and do less. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting. For those of you listening, um, I'm asking because I want to know. This is really, you know, it's not like I'm kind of prepping these questions and they were pre-planned. Um, so that it's really good to know that you have 25 modules that, are, that you know, address um, you know, the stress management and all of that. It, it sounds like it's a, it's a well-thought-out program, so that's great. You have another question, we, We've Joe. got a couple here. Uh, Peggy from Mesa. Um, do you check to make sure when, when you start your program that there is not another issue like thyroid or and are there shots involved? Good question. Peggy, that is a very good question. Anyways, so yes, we do check if there is an existing thyroid problem because we know for a fact that if there is thyroid imbalances, the chances of you losing weight is nil. So we've got to make sure we have a lab um, draws our blood work that we need to do prior to doing the weight loss. And along with that, we also check EKGs. So yes, we have pre-examinations that we do prior to even prescribing a diet or medication. And there are no shots involved unless you want the extra vitamin B12 or a multivitamin that we can give on a monthly basis. Right, but that's not necessary. Not necessary. Okay, and that's good to know for people that are thinking about this program. Good. Uh, Brett from Tempe. Um, I recently did the HGH. I lost 84 pounds. And I've gained back 105, and I'm frustrated, and he sounded very frustrated. Well, uh, Brett, uh, you know, you brought the topic up that I was going to bring it up myself anyway if nobody asked. The HCG diet uh, is uh, kind of the most popular thing that kind of uh, happened over the last couple of years, and there are uh, several others of that form. You do lose weight because you're on a 500 calorie diet, and that is not something that anybody can live on for uh, going forward for months and years. So you will lose weight, but you're always always going to gain the weight back because there's no support mechanism, there's no counseling, there's no follow up in terms of you know as long as you pay for the medication, you get the medication, and you're on a 500 calorie diet, you're going to lose weight. Uh, you don't even need to do anything, but if you're on 500 calorie diet. I can guarantee you everybody will lose weight. Right. And, and for those of you, it's, that's the human growth, the H, HCG. Yeah. HCG is the human, human. chorionic gonadotrophin hormone. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's, you know, via injection, and, and it's really a fad that's been out there. Yeah. I um, didn't want to call it a fad, but now that you said it, it is a fad. There, yeah, there's no doubt. We've admitted as a hospitalist, those of you listening that know that I'm a hospitalist, um, you know, people that have been admitted into the hospital with renal failure, with, you know, muscle breakdown, rhabdomyolysis, and all kinds of different things from the side effect of this diet. So I would be very, very cautious, um, you know, with that. So that, I'm glad that you uh, addressed that. Do you have another question, Joe? Okay. Let's, you know, let's talk a little bit more about um, just liver disease in general. What are some of the other, um, you know, how do you approach somebody with abnormal liver function tests, for example? Can we well, just kind of? Mm -hmm. I think uh, tying in uh, overweight and obesity with liver disease, I, I also want to bring up the topic of what's called Nash syndrome, mm -hmm. N A S H. Nothing to do with Steve Nash <laughs> uh, for all those uh, basketball fans. Nash is non alcoholic because it's not related to alcohol consumption. Steato, that means fatty, hepatitis, inflammation of the liver. That has become yes. a significant problem in the recent past, and this is directly related to. Uh, overweight, which is directly related to the incidence of type 2 diabetes, 
And uh, unfortunately, these people, even though they don't drink, they don't have hepatitis, and they don't do anything that should be responsible for liver disease, are going to end up with cirrhosis. And that is becoming, actually, the American Association of Liver Disease is predicting that NASH is going to be the number one reason for liver transplantation in the next 10 to 20 years from this country. Wow. Wow. And what can be done about it? I mean, is it reversible? Well, it is reversible if you go and lose weight and get your diabetes under control and if you're followed by a proper physician and appropriate measures are taken. It is a reversible condition okay. up to a certain point. Unfortunately, if you progress to the uh, stage of cirrhosis and it is irreversible at that point of time. Very good. So that's why it's important to, uh, okay. you know, to, to get checkups on a routine basis to make sure that blood work is done because a lot of times this can be picked up. It's not symptomatic initially. Is that correct? Exactly. You won't even know that there's something wrong unless your physician does uh, either a blood test which shows abnormal liver enzymes and does an ultrasound of your liver or a CAT scan of your liver which would show what is called fatty infiltration of the liver. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure Sharon would act, uh, like to add a few more things to what I've okay. said so far. That's good. Okay, thanks. Actually, uh, Dr. Reddy so far mentioned uh, all the uh, things that is associated with NASH, but also I would like to uh, point out that um, hyperlipidemia or wherein your, your cholesterol level is very high, that is also another indicator that could actually result into NASH. And uh, on the recent guideline that came out in the management of NASH, vitamin E is actually a recommended medication to okay. lower the lipids and can prevent the progression of um, hepatic steatosis or the fatty liver. That's what I was going to ask you. Is there anything that you recommend dietary-wise or supplement-wise, antioxidants, you just you know, talked about vitamin E, that um, you know, somebody can use to help slow down the progression of, of cirrhosis or you know, liver, liver disease as it relates to NASH? Actually, diet-wise, I would say that the best diet that we can actually get into is a low-fat diet. Okay. Low-fat diet has been prescribed for years and years for patients with cardiac conditions. Mm -hmm. But actually, if you really look at the low-fat diet, it helps with fatty liver. It, it helps with uh, and people with gallbladder diseases. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just an overall excellent diet to follow. Good. Okay. And vitamin E now is, is a recommended treatment. Correct. For okay. NASH syndrome. Fish oil, is that, has that been something that um, has been been recommended, do we know? You know, the reason, I'm gonna, this is an interesting point. Um, for those of you that have animals and pets out there, um, a good friend of mine has, has a dog. And the liver enzymes in the dog is elevated and has been elevated now for, you know, for a few years. And the veterinary, the, the, you know, the, the, the veterinary physician recommended fish oil be given. And I just, I'm, I'm trying to think about what the mechanism is of using that for the liver. Is the dog an overweight dog? Um, um, maybe a little bit. Not, I mean, not More mm -hmm. and more we see obesity in dogs too and pets of all so, kinds. So this dog may actually have NASH, interestingly. Exactly. Okay, that's good. Very good. Joe, another question. Um, Francis Malloy from Phoenix. Uh, I need to lose 100 pounds. Can I be on one of your programs? Want to be straight? Uh, I drink a lot of diet sodas. I drink alcohol on a daily basis. Um, and I use uh, cannabis before bedtime to sleep. Well, we are willing to talk to you. I'm not promising anything. Uh, I think it's a two-way street. Uh, if you want the help, we are willing to help. Uh, there are certain ground rules in terms of uh, being successful in the program. Uh, we need to come to an understanding. I mean, we're not going to tell you to change everything in your life overnight. But as long as you're willing to um, work with us, we will be w willing to work with you. Very good. Any other comments or questions? Okay, good. Um, colonoscopy. You know, we cannot have a gastroenterologist on the show without talking about the importance of, you know, colonoscopy screening um, and how colon cancer really is preventable if we just take the step to make sure that we follow the guidelines. Do you want to speak to that? Oh, I've been in gastroenterology for 30 years, Anne, and I can tell you I have seen in my own professional career the remarkable decrease in the huge, large polyps that we used to see in people's colons when I first started out, you know, 15, 20 years ago. And uh, nowadays, you know, if you find very small polyps, you know, we're like, oh, yeah, we found a polyp. Mm -hmm. um, the, I'm 100% sure that going forward, we're going to see fewer and fewer colon cancers. And you know what? They are unfortunately going to happen in the people who have not had screening colonoscopies. Right. 
anybody who has uh, followed the recommendations and had a screening colonoscopy and follows with their physician will have a much, much lower chance of dying from colon cancer. Okay, and I mean, I think that says it all. Um, and the recommendation is really baseline at the age of 50. For most people, the baseline is uh, screening colonoscopy at the age of 50. Uh, if you're an African American, it could even start at the age of 40. And there are other uh, conditions such as family history, uh, conditions such as inflammatory bowel disease like ulcerative colitis, and many other conditions which your physician will help you decide, which may either increase or decrease the frequency with which you okay. should have colonoscopies, as well as tell you at what time you should have your first one. Very good, very good. Okay. And, you know, a lot of people who put it off or who really don't want to have colonoscopies really do it because they hear so, like, nightmares about the prep. And, you know, and I try to get through to people that really it's, it's not – it's not that bad. It's not like it used to be. Do you want to kind of give us a, an idea of what Sharon the prep is? is the expert Sharon is the expert in the do preps. That. That's perfect. Actually, that's always a question that I come across with. Every time they come into the room, they always look at me, please don't give me that nasty prep. And every single time I ask them what that nasty prep is, they always say it's that whole gallon thing. Well, we have a lot of options now. There's a lot of prep that we can use. Also, we have other considerations to do. But anyhow, um, okay. in our office, we have been a fan of um, Miralax and Gatorade mm -hmm. combination, mm -hmm. which is the patient's love. Um, our main purpose is it does the same thing. It serves the same purpose. It achieves the same results. And the best part about it is that they're drinking smaller amounts of fluids, and um, it tastes better. Right. So a lot of our patients are, that is, that's all. This is great. It's very easy. Miralax, yeah, you can get easy. over the counter. It's tasteless, odorless. You mix it in the, the, the beverage of your choice, really. Right. Um, yes. And it, it does the job in order to prep for uh, an yes. accurate colonoscopy. And there are also tablets that are available, mm -hmm. Osmo Prep tablets that are available for prep. There are smaller mag um, magnesium citrate that is available. So it just really depends on what the condition is. If the patient has been chronically constipated, well, definitely we're not going to we're not going to use simpler or lower volume. Right. You may want to be more aggressive. Correct. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. A couple of changes have happened over the last uh, 20 years. Um, First, when I first started doing colonoscopies, the prep used to be a gallon jug of what's called uh, old-fashionedly go lightly. Uh, and the sedation that we used for most patients was what was called conscious sedation, that the patient was half conscious when the procedure was done. So unfortunately, some people had terrible experiences and those stories have lingered on. Uh, what has happened over the last 20, 25 years is the technology is so much better the equipment that we use are much, much better. We have high-definition scopes. We have high-definition monitors. Uh, the preparation is so much different. And the sedation that we use these days is called propofol, which is almost on the border of general anesthesia where the patient remembers nothing from the moment the procedure is started to the moment the procedure is done. It's very, very comfortable. Uh, and they wake up right away. I mean, the, the best news is, you know, when they wake up from the sedation, it's not like they're going to have long-lasting effect, effects of the sedation. Mm -hmm. And it's very safe. And uh, it's really about going in, taking a, like a 30-minute, 40-minute nap, and then coming out and really having the, the peace of mind to know that, you know, hey, you know, my colon is clear. And you may not have to come back for another 10 years. Exactly. Exactly. So, um, you know, from the age of 50, those of you listening, um, highly, highly encourage uh, a colonoscopy to be done. Um, I think that's very, very important. Food allergies. You know, this is another um, big topic. Gluten sensitivity. You know, do you want to speak to that? Because, you know, I see a lot of people come into the hospital with abdominal pain and, you know, and different complaints. And, you know, sometimes we don't think that a food allergy can be responsible for symptoms like that. Uh, do, do you see that? Is it something that, that maybe our listeners might be interested to, to hear about? Sharon? Sure. You want to talk about celiac sprue, maybe? Mm -hmm. Well, I would have to say that I see a lot of people who are pretty much yeah. sensitive to gluten. No. Mm -hmm. um, um, and a lot of uh, times they always yeah. uh, complain yeah, about be, abdominal yeah, pain fine. and diarrhea when they come to the office. And then we test them through blood work. And in fact, you know, they it will come back positive for, for celiac no, no. disease. Mm -hmm. So it is a disease that is... I would say for patients themselves, it's a change and 
lifestyle modification, dietary modification, which they find very hard. Mm -hmm. um, but Dr. Reddy, I'm pretty sure, has more knowledge about celiac than I do. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I think for a lay person who doesn't know what celiac sprue is, uh, it's also called gluten enteropathy or gluten sensitive disease. Gluten is the protein that is present in wheat. I mean, if you eat pizza and bread and any kind of wheat-derived products, you're getting gluten in your diet. Actually, uh, many bakers who make the, the, the good-tasting pizza add extra gluten uh, to the wheat flour to make sure that it kind of feels and tastes the, the right kind of taste. Uh, uh, one in eight Caucasians, uh, unfortunately, have sensitivity to gluten. Interesting. I mean, so it's a very large percentage of patients who pretty much for their entire life and live with this like, oh, I, I can't eat this or I can't eat that or I have bloating and gassiness and lose tools when I eat this or eat that. So uh, it's a very, very common problem. And next only to lactose intolerance, which is probably even a more prevalent condition when we're talking about food allergies. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think these are two number one and number two of food allergy groups that we see. Okay, so lactose intolerance being milk, cheese, dairy products. Yeah, anything that has lactose, sugar, uh, and usually, yeah, absolutely right, milk, ice creams, cheese, I mean, which are, you know, in everybody's diet pretty much every day. Right, right, and it presents like a, in a bloatedness. What, what is their main, the main symptom? Lactose intolerance, most patients will complain of uh, bloatedness, gassiness, uh, loose stools, uh, urgency even in terms of... Uh, especially you go to a restaurant and eat something that is like really heavy in cream and things like that, you got to use the restroom before you go home. Right. Now, Dr. Reddy, it's not common to see blood with lactose intolerance. Uh, is it or, you know, is that something uh, that... I, I, blood in the stool is a red flag. I mean, if you see blood in your stool, please do not ignore it. Do not assume that it is the hemorrhoids right. or if it is this or that. Please talk to somebody and make sure that an appropriate evaluation has been carried out to make sure right. that something serious is And so really the point is, you know, if you do have lactose intolerance and you go out and you eat, you know, uh, a big bowl of ice cream and then it causes diarrhea but there's blood there, that would be a red flag. That I would is be a cautious. warning. That is right. not pure lactose intolerance. There's mm -hmm. something else going on. Okay. And that's important to, you know, to kind of know your body so that you can kind of pick up those, those warning signs. Um, that's good. I know there's, Joe's been on the phone with, uh, with a question that we'll get to in, in here in just a moment. Um, you know, gallbladder is just such a broad, you know, um, topic. And uh, from a gastroenterology uh, standpoint, do, do you want to kind of give us a little, give our listeners just a little information about, you know, gallstones, what are they, how do we treat them, how do they present, you know, those kinds of things. Gallbladder disease, mainly we're looking at two different things, you know, the chronic inflammation or the inflammation of the gallbladder, the presence of stones in the gallbladder, as well as, you know, the biliary dyskinesia, which is the slowing down of the gallbladder. And interestingly enough, we've been talking about obesity, and we see this a lot in patients who are overweight. Mm -hmm. Gallbladder disease is very, very common, not to mention, you know, if you are Caucasian, if you are over 40s, you know, you fit the picture of having uh, somebody who can potentially have gallbladder disease. So the most common uh, manifestations of a gallbladder disease is epigastric pain or where you have the pain in between your esophagus and your stomach and also the right side upper quadrant pain. And um, I have seen that a lot in the practice. And um, a lot of times they say that the pain radiates to the back, it's more like kidney pain, and um, it's, a, it's a very common uh, manifestation. And um, a lot of times we have them check and have an ultrasound done to make sure that there's not a uh, stone that is present or there is no presence of inflammation in the gallbladder. However, I have seen a lot of cases also of chronic inflammation, and when we do a HIDA scan of the abdomen or the HIDA scan of the gallbladder, especially with the introduction of an enzyme called the CCK, we've seen that a lot of the gallbladders are not working right. at 100%. You mm -hmm. know, the cutoff is 35%, and we see people with zero percentage of ejection fraction of the bowel, which is the green acid that is produced by the liver and is stored in the uh, gallbladder. Mm -hmm. And you know, that could be a chronic condition and that can cause chronic abdominal pain, especially in the right side of the abdomen. So in that case, the recommendation would be to have the gallbladder taken out, is that? N not right away. Okay. If we have a gallbladder dyskinesia, which is the slowing down of uh, the gallbladder, the first recommendation that we do is, hey, you know, try a low-fat diet. Let's see if, you know, there is a symptom improvement. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it does not reverse itself. So eventually, 
you will go into and have a surgical evaluation whether or not that would be the right thing to do at the moment. But we always try to diet first. Okay. That's important for listeners to hear. Joe, you have We a have question? quite a lot of questions okay, here. Good. Um, can we jump off the, the subject one time for a person that says, please, I, I really would like to ask this question. Sure. Okay. Um, Betty from Santan Valley has a minimum displaced fracture of the tibula of the tip. Um, she was in a soft cast for a month and really watches her exercise and walking and all that to, to have it heal. She's in constant pain all the time. Uh, and if she overexerts just a little tiny bit, it's just almost unbearable. Um, how, how long does it take for something like that to heal? You know, and should she seek a second opinion? Or I would recommend if the pain persists or is escalating, absolutely. She needs to seek help. You know, get get in to see her doc. I don't know if she saw an orthopedic physician or a podiatrist or, or you know, who. She said she saw um, a specialist. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, because, you know, who knows that, that non-displaced fracture could sometimes turn into a displaced fracture. And then we're talking about, you know, decreased blood flow to that bone, mm. and it can be, it can be dangerous. So um, absolutely, if you're having pain, I would recommend that you uh, get in to, to seek another shouldn't take another months opinion. to heal that? It shouldn't take that long, no. No, it shouldn't. Um, and that's a little bit off of the topic of right. GI. So, um, you know, we can maybe even talk to her a little bit later if, if gotcha. need be. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Betty. Um, Max from New Hampshire. Uh, let's see. Is there a way, this is back to the colonoscopy. Uh, is there a way to get it done without the normal techniques, for example, via ultrasound? Uh, very good question. There are several ways of looking at the colon. Uh, colonoscopy is probably the preferred and the best way, but for somebody for whatever reason who cannot have this, uh, one option would be what's called an air contrast barrier manoma, which is an x-ray examination. And the newer technique, which has kind of uh, come into vogue in the last four or five years, is what is called a CT colonography. And there are some people who are also doing MR colonographies now. Uh, there are advantages and disadvantages and price issues that you need to consider and then the risk benefit that really helps your physician decide for you which one is the optimum test for you. Very good question. You know, just off the top, um, the, we, I just want to make a comment about if somebody does go in for a CT um, or an MRI of the colon, if a polyp is noted, they're going to end up having to have a colonoscopy anyway to remove that. Not only that, they'll have to take a preparation another time, they'll have to take another day off, and whoever comes with them will have to take another day off, so you're talking about. And you're, uh, uh, and a lot of times people ask me the question, you know, how often does somebody find a polyp when somebody goes in for a screening colonoscopy? National studies have shown that one in four people over the age of 50 have colon polyps. So that means if you go for a CT colonography or an MR, you're more than likely, 25% of the chance at least, needing a repeat colonoscopy to take the polyp out. Right, right. And just by looking at it really is not enough. No, you know? no. That's only a diagnostic tool. That's not a therapeutic mm -hmm, tool. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's good. Next question. Uh, Thor J. from Lubbock, Texas. Okay. How long should it take on your program just an idea to lose 75 to 125 pounds on a regular, not trying to be crazy and say I want to lose it by next Tuesday, but just on a regular program of yours for a male. Okay, so average of 100 pound weight loss, in your experience, what, how long would that take? Safely, you know, we, so that they, um, not only do they lose it, but they sustain that weight loss based on your program. I think the average would be about a pound a week Maybe uh, if you really are very aggressive, maybe um, one and a half pounds a week. I mean, that would be maybe like the maximum. So you're looking at an extended period of working hard together, you and your physician, and making sure that you do the right thing. Because what you don't want to do is just by losing the weight that you get sicker in other ways right. and substitute one problem for another problem. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's not really the absolute number but it's distribution of, you know, of fat and muscle and, you know, so, um, you know, you can be much healthier but still weigh, you know, a certain number. Appropriate weight, yeah, exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so 100 uh, pounds would be, you're talking at least a good a year mm -hmm. plus. Eight months to a year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Which, 
is probably the the healthiest way to do that. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, just talking about gallbladder disease, you know, we were taught, and we see it on occasion, and I want to confirm it with you as a, as a GI doc, um, when you lose weight too fast, does that exacerbate gallbladder stones and, and gallbladder uh, oh, disease? Oh, we see this all the time. Patients who have had bariatric surgery, which is kind of the uh, another uh, uh, way of losing weight quickly, which is, you know, you have a gastric sleeve or a gastric bypass surgery, a majority of those patients within the next five years after the bariatric surgery develop gallstone disease. And unfortunately, some of them actually go on to develop pancreatitis as a result of one of those little stones passing through the bile duct into the small intestine. So in the olden days, and I'm talking about, you know, 10, 15 years ago when bariatric surgery was kind of begin, beginnings of bariatric surgery, they automatically used to take the gallbladders out at the time of the bariatric surgery. Now that has fallen out of uh, fashion, uh, now they wait for the gallbladder to develop problems and then they go back and take the gallbladder out at that time. Mm -hmm. Is it more common in men versus women or is it pretty much equal incidence? Uh, it, we used to think that it was more female, fertile, in 40s, and fair mm -hmm. uh, was kind of the typical description mm -hmm. of the gallstone disease, but I don't think there's really a significant percentage difference. But there's one subgroup of ethnic people uh, that we see around here, especially in the Phoenix area, the Native Americans, who have a markedly incid high incidence of gallstone disease. Interesting. Okay. Okay, that's good. Um, H. pylori, I, you know, I know that that we see a lot of it and it's an infection and I would like for for you maybe to really give us a good handle on what is it what is this infection that is you know in the stomach that can lead even to gastric cancer sometimes um, how do you how do you talk about Sharon that? Magalona is the expert in our office on H. pylori good good it's common do you see a lot of it Sharon in the last month yes we approximately treat maybe five patients every week wow. with H. pylori that's almost one a day Exactly. Mm -hmm. And every single time okay. I get the pathology report from Dr. Reddy, it's always, hey, another H. pylori case. Mm -hmm. But anyway, H. pylori is a bacteria that we can harbor in the stomach for a long period of time. It can be transmitted by way of contaminated water, contaminated food, or from another um, infected person. And um, the most effective test that I have seen so far and that worked in our practice is I always do a stool antigen test to okay. check for the H. pylori. The reason being, when this patient goes to their primary care doctors and they complain of dyspepsia and GERDs, they're already on proton pump inhibitors, right. which are the medications like, you know, your protonics, your omeprazole, your prevacid, and this affects the breath test that we most commonly do for H. pylori. Mm -hmm. And so that becomes, you know, the test is not as effective and it's not as accurate. Right. But then when they come to the office, we, stool, we, we check the stool for H. pylori, they come back positive, then we give them appropriate medication. But uh, mm -hmm. what about a blood test? The uh, blood test, I'm kind of partial to the blood test. I still believe that the bacteria being of a GI origin would rather check something that comes from the GI, which is the mm -hmm. stool. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, that's a good point. There are other tests, blood tests, as you mentioned. We can also do what's called a breath test or the urea breath test. And the most definitive would be what's called an endoscopy with a tissue biopsy. Obviously, that's the most expensive way of trying to find out if somebody has H. pylori. Right. So just for our listeners that really have never heard this before, helicobacter, you know, pylori, H. pylori is a bacteria um, that really, I mean, it, you don't feel anything. It's not like you feel sick or, you know like you would think of a bacterial infection. Is not, that right? Not necessarily. I mean, these are specifically confined to the gastrointestinal tract. So majority of the times, patients have dyspeptia symptoms, so they have burning in the stomach, mm -hmm. they have ulcer-like symptoms, or uh, right, like bloated, bloatedness, mm -hmm. gassiness, excessive belching. These could be some of the kind of the symptoms that go with H. pylori infection. Mm -hmm. And people who are H. pylori who have ulcers frequently, they're almost always found to be H. pylori positive. Right, and it's hard to eradicate the ulcer until the bacteria is treated. Exactly. Is right? mm -hmm. There is a specific combination of medications that you need to take to get rid of the infection. Right, antibiotics. Mm -hmm. Joe. Uh, Marcus, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, says um, on one of your programs, does soda or diet soda uh, have to be completely cut out, and what about bread and carbs? For the weight loss program, actually, we have a quick start prescribed, you know, diet 
that we go that we do alongside with the nutrition that we're prescribing and I would suggest yes diet soda we need to take it out of the diet not only because it doesn't really matter if it says it's diet it does not contain sugar but you've got to consider the caffeine that is in it the acid that is contained in it you know it is not healthy period there's Absolutely nothing healthy agree. about that mm -hmm. and the second question is carbs there is a certain percentage of how much carbs we can eat it's not necessarily totally taking the carbs out of the system or on your diet but there is also a lesser percentage of carbs so we cut the percentage lower but not totally in eradicate the carbs from your diet right and I think each person is individually assessed um, you know so that uh, you know let's say I mean there are phases I'm sure you know, so for example, if you come in and, and uh, diet soda is something that you really, you know, crave and desire, there may be some other lifestyle changes that you may implement and then gradually, you know, start making further changes. Is, is Again, really I want to emphasize it's working together. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not uh, here is a prescription, go fill it and you'll be fine right. next week. Uh, we want to work together. We want to understand where you're coming from, what your dietary habits are, what your needs are. There may be somebody who's saying, I'm going to get married in three months and I want to lose 25 pounds and I want to look perfect. Mm -hmm. And we can help that person. And there may be another person who says, you know what, my diabetes is out of control, my arthritis is out of control, or my blood pressure is out of control, and you need to do something before I have some major catastrophe like a heart attack or a stroke. And we can help that person. But each person's needs and benefits and risks are different, and each one has to be individualized on that basis. Very good, very good. Any other questions there, Joe? Okay. You know, you, we were talking about proton pump inhibitors and acid-type medicines. Um, the one question that I often get in the hospital when I'm, you know, dealing with patients and prescribing it um, is, well, is it safe to take this medicine? How, you know, I've been on this med My doctor, you know, prescribed this 10 years ago. I'm still on it. Is it safe to stay on the proton pump inhibitor, the H2 blockers? you know, those kinds of things. Uh, these are very safe medications. Obviously, there are many things that you need to consider. Again, um, in the last few years, uh, if a patient is on a medication called Plavix that is kind of commonly prescribed for anybody who has had heart disease and stent placed, there are many proton pump inhibitors that the patient should not be on. Mm -hmm. But there are others which are safer and they can be used when somebody's on that. As far as long-term use of H2 receptor antagonists, and proton pump inhibitor medications. There are studies which show that there is um, uh, a problem with uh, B12 absorption, calcium absorption, a frequency of pneumonias. There are studies which indicate that C. diff, which is a particular type of bug in the intestinal tract, that there is an increased prevalence of these infections. But for the vast majority of patients, there is no problem if they have to be on a maintenance medication for a long time. But again, um, when I say that, I'm assuming that you're seeing a physician and that your prescriptions are being filled by a physician or a nurse practitioner or a medical provider and that you're being continuously monitored so that there is no uh, adverse uh, um, side effects from these medications. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, you know, we talked about the colonoscopy. Let's talk about the endoscopy now. Um, you know, when you, when you have a patient that you're assessing for gastroesophageal reflux or ulcers, um, do you just want to speak to the, uh, the indications for endoscopy? With the ever-increasing uh, percentage of people being overweight and obese, we see more and more people having heartburn issues. Mm -hmm. And uh, chronic heartburn, which we define as having uh, n multiple episodes of heartburn over a week, and if you have more than five episodes, uh, you're, uh, and if you have it for an extended period of time, more than six months duration, then you have chronic heartburn. You could yeah. be setting yourself up for uh, some serious conditions such as, you know, strictures in the esophagus, ulcers in the esophagus, and you can eventually develop a condition called Barrett's esophagus. And unfortunately, Barrett's is a precancerous condition, and there are increasing percentage of people who are developing cancer at the junction of the esophagus and the stomach as a result of having chronic acid reflux. Mm -hmm. Again, all of these conditions, if you pick them up early enough, can be treated and you can avoid the much more serious complications for almost 100% of the times. So the key to it is making an early diagnosis right. and the only way you're going to get a correct diagnosis is going to the right doctor. Mm -hmm. And I know we have a question but I just want to make a comment um, in terms of reflux. There are certain things that tend to relax the sphincter to, that, that propagates or, or makes uh, reflux more common. 
like peppermint, or maybe you want to speak to some of the things to really avoid. If somebody is out there listening and that has gastroesophageal reflux, um, you know, what would we tell them to avoid and to do to help limit those symptoms or minimize? L lifestyle changes that would really be recommended would be uh, decreasing caffeine consumption would be the number one. If you're a cigarette smoker, you want to try to cut down on the nicotine use. Uh, third thing is if you're overweight, you want to lose weight again. Uh, number four is if you're on certain medications called calcium channel blockers or estrogen-like hormone preparations, you need to make sure that, you know, they're in the appropriate dose so that you're not taking too much of those medications. And the third or last thing is, you know, you don't want to be overeating at a meal where you want to get up from the table with still a little bit more room in the stomach rather than overstuffing yourself to the point where, and I, I know a lot of people like to go to the buffets and uh, make uh, kind of the best use of the money that they paid for in terms of filling up and piling up on the plate, but that's really not good for you. And especially if you're a late night eater, you want to make sure that you're either sitting upright or walking around at least for a good half hour after a huge and heavy meal. And then the last thing is alcohol. Uh, you really want to make sure that it is in moderation. Everything in moderation, no problem. Very good. The problem is when you overdo anything. Excessive, right. You know, this is really great information. Um, when you think about Doc Talk Radio, what we're doing is we're bringing, you know, medical specialists that are practicing, you know, mainstream medicine, opening up the lines for people to call in and ask. Um, so this is, you know, it's really an opportunity. So, you know, I invite you to, to take advantage of, um, you know, of this time. Do you have a question? Uh, Cheryl Lynn Kenosha, Wisconsin. Um, how can I get on a program with you? Uh, very impressed. Um, I think you're awesome, Dr. Reddy. But since I live here in Wisconsin, can we do this some other way than me going into your office? And love the show. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Aaron. <laughs> well, I absolutely appreciate you calling us. Uh, you know what? Wisconsin is not the best place to be in the months of January and February. <laughs> you are always welcome to visit us in Scottsdale, Arizona, where the weather is perfect and we are almost the most hospitable people to the people from the north during those winter months. So, so there's really, it's not a national, there's no um, satellite program or office. The Center there. for Medical Weight Loss is based out of New York. We are affiliated with them. Uh, we are partners. So I l have to look up on the website and see if there is a center in Wisconsin. You know, while we're talking, what is the website? If people's interested in maybe, you know, connecting with you or accessing your information, what, what is your website? Our medical weight loss is also under readygiassociates.com. Okay. And our office phone number, if I may, is 480-393-0575. Um, we have the most wonderful employees in our office. We'll be always willing to help you. Very good. Um, you know, we only have a few. Do you believe the hour is almost over? It's unbelievable. It really, we're having I mean, fun. This really, really went quick. Um, you know, just talking about GI conditions, um, living in Arizona, you know, skin and, and, you know, sun exposure and all of that. In your opinion, is there anything that shows up on the skin that can give people kind of uh, a heads up that there's something going on in the GI tract? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's just unbelievable. I mean, take for example, celiac sprue. Uh, they can develop these little, uh, kind of little blister-like condition. It's called dermatitis herpetiformis. It looks like a little herpetic vesicle, uh, but it is typical for a celiac sprue diagnosis. Uh, take for example, a patient who has gallbladder disease. When their eyes start turning yellow and the urine starts turning yellow, they may have a problem with uh, their, uh, their take, for example, a patient who has Crohn's disease and an ulcerative colitis and is developing these new ulcers on their legs. It's called a pyoderma gangrenosum. Th these illnesses are uh, multi-system manifestations a lot of times. Uh, it depends on, uh, you know, unfortunately, the stage of the disease. If you catch a disease very early, uh, you may not have all the manifestations, but if you catch a patient at a little bit advanced stage, you're going to find a lot of different um, mm -hmm. uh, manifestations on the skin. Like liver, we talked about the telangiectasias or the thinning of... You're so mm -hmm. right, palmar erythema, we all learned this in medical school, mm -hmm. telangiectasias and um, many other uh, clubbing of the fingers. Uh, right fingernails. Mm -hmm. exactly. And you know, for, again, for those of you listening, these are all signs, subtle signs that the practitioner looks for. They kind of clues us in that, that there may be something more going on systemically. Um, and the GI tract is one of, one of the organs in the body that really has a lot of manifestations that show up in the eyes, in the color of the, you know, the skin and, and different things. So um, 
it, it's very interesting to kind of tune into that and, and be aware of what's going on, you know, both inside the body but on the surface as well. Joe, question. Brandon from New River. Um, I have constant diarrhea. I've also had a lot of reflux. Um, should I make an appointment or can you give me a simple solution that might help? There is no simple solution for a problem like that. I mean, Bren, if you're having a serious enough situation where you felt a need to even call us on this doc radio, that means you have a need to go see a good physician who can really help you and hopefully fix the problem for you. Right. There are a lot of um, things that can cause chronic diarrhea. You know, that's a, I'm sure that's something big that you see in the office. Something as simple as irritable bowel syndrome to colon cancer and anything in between. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, different foods can do it. Um, Sharon, anything else you want to you wanna add as we kind of wrap this up? I'm really impressed with, with, with you, and thank you for being here to, to kind of share with us on, on the show. Well, I just really would like to tell everybody to please do your colon screening. It is very important. Colon cancer is still ranks number three as the cause of cancer deaths in the U.S. So I really encourage everybody to do the colon screening. And please be aware of the kind of foods that you eat. You know, the healthier, we want to see a healthy America. And if we can just stay on top of our diets, stay in the right weight and prevent obesity, that would help a lot, a lot in the long run. You know, that brings up just one comment that I want to make, um, and that's for children. Do, do, you, um, do you treat children in your weight loss clinic at all, or is this pretty much adult medicine only? We are adult gastroenterologists, okay. and I think we were... Uh, the whole idea reason that we started the complementary uh, medical weight loss is because it's part and parcel of what we do in our daily medical practice. We do have a pediatric gastroenterologist who comes to our office once a week. Um, I don't think he's into weight loss yet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think that we're heading there because you said a healthy America, what I think of is it, it's got to start you know, with our children. Um, I think obesity is an epidemic in, in our younger people today. Um, and I think it's important to address that and acknowledge yes. that. Yes, and actually we have a really, really good uh, guideline for obesity management. Okay, good. And I, probably on the website we can, you know, they can get information. Um, okay. There's another question. We're going to finish up with one last uh, question, and then we can, then we can okay. wrap it up. Um, thank you so much for being here. Well, this and, is, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I got to thank you so much for hosting the show and being a wonderful uh, host um, on welcoming us back mm -hmm. we feel really at home good and good. i know you're a wonderful source of information i hopefully people all over Thank the world will much. start uh, picking up in more numbers because by telling yeah. your friends yes. to listen to the show that's neat this that's one. what's neat about the show is that it's web web based so we web can kind of reach and out they can tell all their friends and family mm -hmm. members you know what tune in and listen to dr Bory. all right yes. good joe last question uh charlene from tempe gets the last question of the show here I am always 15 pounds away from being my ideal weight. Can your program get me over that hump, or is it only for obese people? Good question. Mm -hmm. We can surely help you uh, get over the hump. Uh, we will, uh, and not only will we get you over the hump, we will try to make sure that you stay That's the key. beyond that point because there's no point in just losing it and then come Christmas time, gain it all back and plus more. Absolutely. And your local, um, I would highly, highly recommend these folks. Uh, Dr. Reddy, we've worked with, Sharon, we've worked with, and I know that um, it's a medically sound program. And, and so um, absolutely, I give it two thumbs up and, and would recommend anybody to, to take part in it. Almost every single person that had called in was calling in and, and said, wow, this is really, uh, really good. fantastic. Excellent. We appreciate the comments. Thank you very much. You're welcome. You. Um, Facebook, and if, uh, those of you out there, um, please check out our Facebook page. Uh, we have a Doc Talk Radio website, www.doctalkradio.com. Check it out. Um, we'll have some clips from the show. We have probably now over 250 clips from the Doc Talk shows of the past, um, and we have a lot more you know, future shows in store. So thank you so much for, for joining in. This concludes Doc Talk Radio with Dr. Ann Borick. Till next time, I wish you health, wellness, and many blessings. Doc Talk Radio is brought to you by Gilbert Hospital and Florence and Anthem Hospitals. Topics discussed are for informational and not intended to substitute advice from your personal physician.